Um, my name is uh, Chris Janssen. Um, I've been uh, working as a, a full stack developer for about five, well, I think it's about six years now. Um, besides that, um, I also went back to university a few years ago, uh, so I'm currently a student as well. And um, I'm expecting to graduate in a few months uh, on my research on how uh, organizations can con contribute more or start contributing to open source software development. Uh, and besides that, I'm also a father of a, a small daughter. Some of you have already seen her up the on the screen. Uh, she's two and a half years old now. Um, first of all, I want to thank iBuildings and UntPal. Um, iBuildings for giving me the time to prepare for this um, prepare this uh, well session, and UntPal for sponsoring my um, stay here and my travel and everything else. So uh, I'm actually here for free. That's nice. So. What will we be talking about? Um, I will be giving, um, uh, first of all, uh, a definition of performance, or at least what I believe performance is about. I will also um, introduce a method, a method with, with which you can um, approach performance problems and hopefully fix them in a, yeah, an, an effective and efficient manner. And I'll give you some uh, practical practical performance improvements and examples you can hopefully use in your daily, uh, daily life, in your daily work. So let's first de define performance. You can basically define perform uh, have two definitions for performance. There's the measurable performance, which you can actually measure. Um, think about page load time or the, the resources that are used on the server. Uh, but also think about res response time times of your server. Uh, those are all things you can measure and which you can optimize. Uh, but that's not all. Um, that only goes so far. There's also something called perceived performance, which is basically how your end user perceives the performance of your project, uh, of your product. For example, you can have a really complex page which takes up to 30, 40 seconds to load in its entirely. But um, for your end user, it might seem very fast because the initial content, that what they need first, the most useful content, is actually there within a second. Facebook has a great examples of this uh, with their uh, well, the delayed loading of sp specific blocks on the pages and stuff. But also, uh, activity feedback is something which uh, doesn't actually do anything. It's, for example, if you press save somewhere, uh, and you get this little spinner. It says, yeah, I'm working here. Wait, please wait, I'm working here. Just the fact that a thing is, is, is rotated, rotating and showing some kind of activity makes your um, end users think that the system is telling them, okay, I'm working, I'm busy, please, please stay uh, patient and I'll get to you. As soon as it stops, then, well... They'll uh, think the performance is bad, but just adding a, a, a simple spinner like that will increase uh, the perceived performance of things. It's really funny how the mind works. Um, so let's introduce a method to the madness. Um, being a student at the moment, one of the things they keep on uh, hammering on about uh, in university is um, methods. Um, and uh, I don't know if, uh, if you've ever heard of the Deming Circle, any of you? Basically, it's plan, do, jack, act. That's what you've got up here. Um, it's just uh, a matter of um, defining your key content, maybe the, the plan um, part of it. Set some goals. What do I want to achieve? Then actually improve the performance. But the most important part, verify if your improvements are actually improvements. Sometimes things you think are uh, beneficial actually have um, well, a, a performance drawback. They actually make things worse sometimes. So how do you define that key content? The first, thing you, the first step you need to do. 
Well, you ask yourself, what is my, my visitor, what is my end user looking for? This may be a, a certain important conversion page, it may be a landing page, it may be some other kind of key information, it may be um, some kind of process they have to do. That, that key part of your website, of your application, that's what you need to focus on. That's the, the thing that needs to perform. Um, like I said, for example, uh, your editors, you shouldn't forget those either because sometimes you have editing pro processes or, or workflows which just they spend about all their day in. They need to be performing. So you, but, but it depends per project. So you, you have to look very closely at your project and see what is it I am trying to achieve, uh, what are my users trying to achieve, and how can we make that uh, experience as good as possible performance-wise. That brings us to the next part. We need to set some goals. Um, thinking performance, performance is bad, sure, it's, it's a gut feeling, but you need to think about, okay, so what am I expecting my application to do to actually feel like it has good performance? And that's something you need to be smart about. Again, something they are hammering on at school. But it actually is true. You need to be smart about it. You need to set specific goals which are measurable, acceptable, realistic, and time-bound. For example, um, if your user is on a desktop PC with a decent internet connection, the home page should be, uh, first view should be fully loaded in under three seconds. That's a pretty specific goal. But then also, if you say the repeat views is un are in under one and a half seconds, then you've basically covered the entire case. And you're saying, okay, for me, on a performance level, uh, three seconds for the first view is acceptable, and one and a half seconds for a re repeat view is acceptable. That's what we're, what we're aiming to achieve. And you have to write these goals down because they, you are going to be verifying your results based on the goals you have set. It's not something you have to keep in your mind. You have to write it down. Not just for yourself, but also for your client who are saying, yeah, 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 performance is shitty. And you're like, well, yeah, but we agreed a few months ago on these metrics and I can prove that, I can measure them so I can prove we are uh, getting to the results we, we set out to, to achieve. So actually the performance is good. Or we need to adjust and go again. So now we know um, what is important to the visitor, what is important to our clients. We know what we perceive as fast or acceptable performance. So now let's um, start improving the current performance. Once again, you have the same little cycle. But in this case, we start out by identifying bottlenecks. Um, every, every one of you, I think, um, has worked on projects where you have these pages that you just know are not performing right. Could I see some hands who have, for, for people who have encountered that, for clients who said, yeah, that page sucks. I think everybody has it. So that's a, a really easy way to identify the bottlenecks. Um, then after you've identified those, those bottlenecks, you're going to have to start brainstorming possible improvements. I'll get into that later on. Then you will actually start implementing those possible um, improvements one by one. And each time verifying the result of your improvements, or maybe not so improvements, to make sure that you are actually working towards meeting your goals. So how do you identify these bottlenecks? Well, the first really um, easy way to find them is to just visit the page with uh, these nice little browser tools you have and look at the browser request timeline. That will basically tell you the response time your server has for each single element on the page. It will also tell you how long it took it to come up with it and to deliver it. 
Maybe the, the page is performing poorly, not because the HTML is very slow, but just because your assets are too big. You know, your images are two, three megabytes. Yeah, there are always editors uploading way too big images or just hot linking them if you don't, well, limit them in what they can do. But stuff like that happens and makes your page slow. Um, once, you've, once you have this browser request timeline, once you have analyzed it, you have a pretty good idea of the, um, yeah, the, the, the area in which your performance problems lie. So if it's images, it's usually probably pretty easy to solve. Just make sure the images are smaller, maybe put a CDN in front of it, and usually you're done. But if it's the request itself, which is usually what happens, it's time to get a little bit more um, aggressive and start benchmarking, for example, with uh, Apache Bench or uh, Gmeter or whatever. There are several tools. Just pick the one you like and start ha taking a look at what causes certain pages to be slow. Sometimes you just have a page that if you view it once, it's all fine. But if you start adding more views at the same time, there's, things start getting slow. Benchmarks are really good at telling you under which conditions um, yeah, you're, you're, you're running into performance problems. And last but not least, and then you're going really deep, is just prof profiling the actual uh, execution path using uh, XHProf or uh, XDebug. And it's not something you're, you're going to want to use to actually get to the problem itself, per se, right away. But you want to get a general idea of where is this performance bottleneck? What is going wrong? Which function, which uh, general area of my code is, pro is, is giving the problems? And also you have to look at what is my environment telling me? Telling me? Is, my, is my server under high load? Uh, are slow queries being logged? Uh, stuff like that. You, you just analyze everything you can to try to figure out where exactly things are going wrong. You'll probably end up with a, a list, a list of all the things you think might be causing problems or are actually uh, causing problems. And then it's time to uh, start making a list of possible improvements. And here you think back to um, what, make, what made those pages or the, 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 the areas you're working on essential for your stakeholders. What is the, the content that they need, what they need? What is the thing they, their, their primary interaction? Because that is important. And very often you'll have pages which have a very narrow uh, primary interaction, but a lot of shit all around it. All kinds of blocks and little listings and stuff like that. And it's usually those things, the, the craft around it, that's causing um, your performance problem. So you need to make, make sure that you know what is essential and what is not, so you can actually start maybe removing things they don't need. Uh, thereby not only improving the performance, but also improving the overall usability of a page because there's less cluttering of stuff. And it's also important to think about, and, that's an, and, and, and with think about, I mean on an abstract lev level, what components make up the page? Um, does it need any uh, custom or very obscure modules to do what it needs to do? Maybe we, need, we, can, we can get rid of those or find an alter alternative. Does it require very, mu very much SQL queries or does it, is it just one very expensive one? Maybe we can start optimizing that later on. Like I said for earlier, it doesn't contain many images. That's usually something which um, screws with performance. <laughs> but once again, you, you should look at this, in, in this stage you should look at it on an abstract level. If you go into the code right away, that will just distract you from the real problems. You'll start looking for, for, the, for, for causes which might not even be there or might be irrelevant. Just think about what is the task I need to do and just focus on that. And then last but not least, um, actually improving the performance. Now it's time to start looking at the code. Now it starts, it's time to start looking at um, 
the the configuration, and this is where you pe uh, you take the list you made earlier and you you start um, thinking about the possible solutions and you uh, order them in um, which possible solution uh, has the best chance of solving the problem. That's the one you're going to use first. So, and you're going to implement just the single one and then measure again. The exact same measurements you did at the beginning, you're going to check, okay, I've made this one single ch change, does it do anything? Does it help my performance? If it does, very good. And if it doesn't, you can just discard a single change. And you're going to the next iteration, and you're going to try the next change, and the next change. And by doing that, you can step by step improve the performance. You can constantly check it with the goals you've set. And as soon as you meet the goals, you can stop working on improving performance because you've met your goal. Sure, maybe there are other things you could be doing on, to improve it, but that's just going to co cost budget. That's just going to cost you extra time, which is not needed because your goals are already met. Additional improvements should be noted down, though, because you can later on maybe um, discuss it with your client to make the changes uh, maybe on a more structural level. And once again, this is in the, the main process of, of it all, you're constantly also verifying the results. See if you met the goals. And uh, like I said, if you find any possibilities for structural improvements, write them down because they can be uh, input for your next iteration of the, of the, main, uh, the main cycle. Are there any questions so far? Okay, that's cool. So let's go uh, and get some practical improvements and uh, examples. Measurable performance, uh, you can improve by, uh, for example, reducing the page load time. But how, is that, how, how do you do that? Well, first of all, if you look at the request timeline, you'll see that there usually are dozens uh, of, of requests going on. If you can find a way to reduce the number of requests, you can all in increase the page load time, for, or decrease the page load time, and thereby increase performance. You can also optimize, do some code, code optimizations to make sure that if, you're, um, for example, your HTML takes a lot of time to, to render and to, to get started, you can, um, if you optimize the code, then it will be delivered further, uh, faster and therefore more performing. You can also reduce, the res reduce resource usage and response times uh, of your server itself by optimizing configuration, uh, maybe uh, queue expensive operations. Sometimes you have um, these systems which have been made to uh, get a lot of data from the database, process it, and then render a result. And this, this, this grabbing of data and processing it could be very expensive and taking a lot of time. Maybe you're better off creating a queue that on cron does the work, saves it in the result in a little variable, and then you can just get that and render it. Stuff like that really improves your performance. You can also offload the database. Um, some websites are using the database for search, or, um, stuff like that. Get it out of the database into its own service, and you'll probably get better response times. And last but, not ne last but not least, you can also implement ca caching. And each of these points I will get into right now to um, so a little more detail. So reducing the number of requests. I think it's obvious that fetching resources takes time. <laughs> and that every request also takes up server resources. So if you have 5,000 requests coming in at the same time for the server uh, on... Um, and, and each of these requests takes 10 images. Maybe if you reuse the, the, the images by half, you're, you're um, freeing up a lot of server resource, resources for uh, other requests, maybe. But especially the re requests requiring Drupal to bootstrap, those are really uh, slow, usually. 
I mean, the web server is optimized to do static resources, and that's, that's fine. But as soon as PHP comes around and you need to bootstrap Drupal, things start getting slow. So how can you reduce those number of requests? Well, for example, if you have a lot of CSS, uh, which uses these little icons and uh, stuff like that, what you often see is that each little icon is an image in itself. Well, if you have 50 of them, those are for each page load, 50 requests needing to be made to the server. You can also combine all these images into a one single big image, a sprite, and use CSS to just get the little piece of the image. That way you can reduce the number of requests by 50 to one, therefore uh, increasing performance. But also, um, many times, modules are just um, defining their JavaScript to be loaded on every page, even when it's not needed. Uh, just a small alteration and just only loading the JavaScript when it's needed can, redu can reduce uh, load time tremendously. And also, turning on aggre uh, aggregation of JavaScript and CSS files, make sure that all these CSS and JavaScript files, which are provided by modules and themes and stuff like that, are combined into one, and thereby reducing the number of requests. The last part is very easy in Drupal. You can just say performance, check, check, submit, done. <laughs> I just added it to be complete. Um, so how do you remove unused JavaScript and CSS? Can you, can you read the code a little? Yeah. OK, cool. So like I said, some or a lot of themes and a lot of um, modules define their JavaScript and their um, uh, style sheets in their info file, like uh, the image above. This means that it gets loaded on every single request. Every Every resource that is, resource that is um, defined in an info file gets loaded always. However, uh, sometimes you just want to load it in certain pages or in certain sections of your site. But you can actually, um, even if they do it like this, without hacking the module, you can change it around so that it only gets loaded when needed. The code example uh, I have here above is um, something I did to do just that for the responsive drop-down um, menu, which we only used in a small section of a website. And what I basically did is check, okay, so we're uh, going to be viewing a block, and if the block is uh, from the responsive drop-down menu, uh, uh, menus module, then we know we, we, we're going to need this JavaScript. And in that case, I will actually um, load the JavaScript and attach it to the render array of the block. And you can see at the bottom there's a little custom flag, allow.js, which get, gets passed on and gets into the entire uh, array of JavaScript files being loaded. Then in another uh, implementation, a hook, uh, an implementation of hook.js alter, uh, I can then l loop over the entire um, list of JavaScript files that are being loaded and look for my little special key, which says allow.js. And as soon as that is set, I know I manually um, added the, J, uh, the, the JS, and that it's coming from the render array. So that's the only case where I don't want to unset it. And therefore, I am removing it on every request unless I actually need it. You can also, like I said, optimize code. Um, one way to do it is to cache expensive operations using the static caching uh, patterns, and you can reduce the number of database queries pretty easy. I'll show you how. So let's say we have this function, and it's very oftenly called. I think uh, maybe, let's say, 10, 15 times per request, depending on the request. But if you look at it, there's this expensive operation which is being done, and this can be a, a function call like I have done it here, or it can be an operation inside of the function itself, doesn't matter. And this one is really, really slow. It takes 100 to 200 milliseconds each time it is being run, and the result is always the same. This is something you can cache. This is something you can, um, a really easy way to improve performance, and I'll show you how again. Basically the same function, but I added um, 
static result in the top, which basically means this variable result we're initializing here, we're initializing it once, and it will stay put even after um, the, mo the, the function is done processing. So the next time um, we are calling this function, we are not initializing a new variable, we're just getting the one we already had. And then we're just checking, is it set? Is there something in it? If there isn't, then we're going to have to do our very expensive operation. But the next time, it's going to be set, and therefore, the expensive operation doesn't need to be done again. So now we can call this, this function 500 times for all I care, and it's just going to be very quick. It's only going to do the operation once. A drawback, though, you cannot clear this cache in this specific case. In Drupal, we found another way to do it. Basically the same idea, but here you're using the Drupal static function, um, which is basically requesting um, one of these cached variables from the Drupal static function namespace. And you see the, the, the underscore, underscore, function, underscore, underscore. That's basically passing the name of the, this function, some other called function, into the Drupal static function as an identifier. So it's just a string representation of the function we are currently in. So if I now want to clear this cache, I can either do just Drupal flush all caches and just throw everything out, it will just work, or I can specifically clear it by, co by calling the Drupal static reset function, putting in the function name, and I'll just clear it. So sometimes you need that, then you can use it. Another uh, very often seen pattern is that, let's say you have this array with uh, user account IDs, and then people start loop looping over it, and in each iteration, they are going to load a single, a single user, do something with it, and then go to the next one and the next one. That means that for every iteration, you're going to be contacting the database, which is about, if you're lucky, 35 milliseconds always, uh, to get the data. Yeah, that's not very effective. What you can also do is instead of loading them once, one by one, you're just doing the user load multiple or entity load multiple or whatever function you're, you're using to load them all at once. That makes it one request. Okay, sure, the one request to the database is going to take a fraction longer because it needs to load all the users. But then it's just one request and you can just loop over the result instead of over the user IDs. Very small change, very big results. You can also improve performance by optimizing configuration. Many websites have many, many, many modules. More often than not, uh, some of these modules are never used. I mean, who here has never had a module that was unused? Yeah, right. Turn those things off, throw them out. Every module, module you have installed adds to your memory load, uh, but it also adds to your execution time because many modules use, act on certain hooks which are always invoked. And every single line of code being executed takes time, so disabling them saves you time. Develop, development modules should never be enabled anyway on production servers, so just turn them off. If you ask me, remove them from the repository. They shouldn't be there. But also UI modules. I mean, how often does your um, moderator need, need to actually change views? I mean, I've never encountered one who needed it. Just turn off that module. It's a small, a small gain. You'll probably not get much, much of it. But this is something you should just make sure never ever happens that they're enabled at all. And what I've also encountered is that sometimes there are, is one very big multi-purpose multi module which takes up a lot of resources and is only used for a really specific task. Maybe that's not the right module to use. Maybe you should re replace it by something which is more effect effective. I've often seen people use, for example, the display suite module to make a, a, a single theme file or a, sim a single um, entity render in a certain way. 
Yeah, that's not really effective. You could, you could do the same thing in code and therefore be a lot faster. Um, and that saves you the, the, the bulk of the, the, the display suite module. I'm not saying you should never use it, but you, should, you need to be considerate about do I need it? Is this essential for my, for my use cases? Is this essential for my users? Do I use it all over the place? Sure, keep on using it. Do I use it in a single instance on that page, which is already being slow? Big chance is probably the, the complex module causing it. Now we're coming to views. I have a love-hate relationship with views. Um, it's, a, it's a really cool module. I think you all, we all agree. But it can also um, really screw up your performance. I have a nice example of something uh, on a recent project. I think it was two weeks ago. We were having, uh, we, we were getting complaints from the client that uh, uh, admin content overview, you know, it was taking 19 seconds to load. So why was it? One of our developers thought it was a great idea to uh, override it with a view because we were using the domain module for, well, domain purposes. Nothing wrong with that. But he thought, while, did, while working on it, eh, since I'm already making a view here, well, let's also show which taxonomy tags are being used on each content type. So he made a, relations, a relation with the taxonomy module and was getting all kinds of duplicate results all at once because, yes, yeah, certain nodes had certain tags, multiple tags, and therefore he was getting duplicate results, even though he was showing all the, all the tags in a single field. So he thought, hmm, yeah, I've been told once that if you get duplicate results, you should use the distinct. Okay, yeah, sure, that works. But if you have like 300,000 nodes, that's going to be taking a while. And in the end, you, the, the, the client didn't want the taxonomy terms to show up anyway, so he removed that. But he left the relation, and he left the distinct. You're guessing how I... I think you know how I was sitting behind my desk when I was looking at this. I was like, idiot! But okay. Funny thing is, I had it figured out in about five minutes. And it took me two more days to convince him that he no longer needed the distinct, and he no longer needed the relation. Okay. <laughs> and rent. Views makes it really easy to fuck things up. So whenever you're getting any page which has a view, which has poor performance, yeah, you're going to have to be looking at views just to be sure that not one of your colleagues have fucked up. And then the first thing you're going to be looking at is things like, okay, do I have any relationships still? Am I, are we using distinct, and is that necessary? Are we using a pager, which means you're going, to have, you're going to have a count query, which is going to count all the rows, which is going to take a lot of time if you have a lot of them. Those are things you can easily change, usually, to gain performance. Um, then, maybe you can start enabling the query caching and the block caching and stuff like that, which would otherwise just be masking the problem. And another small thing you can do to in increase the performance is using syslog instead of dblog. This is actually only a big gain if your entire configuration is screwed up already. As soon as you're getting a lot of errors and a lot of... Um, invalid pages or stuff like that, then it's going to be taking its toll on the DB log module uh, because it's constantly writing and reading from the database. And syslog will speed that up. But, yeah, I think you should use it anyway always because it's really uh, just as easy and you'll never run into problems like that. So I talked earlier about queuing expensive operations stuff like sending emails, generating PDF files, or aggregating votes, reviews, etc., or stuff, just think of something. Usually these are tasks which are done when an, an editor or uh, a user is saving something or uh, is, is creating a comment or stuff like that. Things that they will expect to take a while. 
but they're not expecting it to take half a minute, for example. And a user shouldn't be ha having to wait um, on the generation of his uh, invoice, for example, when he's uh, ordering something. The system should be able to take care of that. I, I uh, encourage you to take a look at the source, I, uh, um, the, the, the examples I've um, um, listed. Because it's a really simple example of how you can use queues. Uh, which basically says that, okay, so an order is being, put, is being entered. Let's uh, get a queue, put a, an, an action into it, and have it being done on, on cron and therefore not having your user waiting on the expensive operation. Like I said, you can also offload the database. For, for very uh, easily uh, improving performance is just changing the, the caching backend to memcache or redis. Take that off the database. That's going to be saving you a lot of uh, yeah, time and effort, and it will also open up uh, some other caching mechanisms I will be uh, talking about in the next slide. Both memcached and Redis, they do require a little bit of knowledge and a little bit of effort to, for, for the first time, implement and get going. But as soon as you're, you're acquainted with them, well, I basically install them everywhere I can because it just saves so much time. And also if you have a site which is doing a lot of searching, make sure you're using a proper search engine for the searching instead of uh, using the database search which is uh, implemented in Drupal core or the, the database backend for search, uh, search API because databases, especially MySQL databases, are not meant for search. That's just not what they're good at. Yeah, sure, they work, but it's never going to be performant. I had um, a project where I changed the database-based search with Solar, and uh, a single query, search query took uh, originally about 15 seconds. Just the, the act of changing it to Solar took it down to f like a second to load the page. So that's a really um, order of magnitude. So caching. You should enable the Drupal page cache. I think everybody knows. Just put it there for completeness. Um, but entity cache, the module, I'm a very big fan, fan of it. But it does require that you're, um, you have an alternate cache backend uh, implemented because they're not clearing the entities, the cached entities from the database. They're just um, expecting your cache backend to be purging stuff. But just Caching those entities, that saves you a lot, well, maybe up to, uh, uh, it depends on how many fields there are on the entity, but the, the, more, the more fields you have, the more impact it's gonna, gonna have. It's, it, yeah, I can't explain really how big the gain is, it really depends, but it always improves uh, performance. And it clears the way for um, the render cache module if you're really into optimizing things. Um, but um, that, that's too detailed to, to actually go in, uh, go into. But it's it's something that which can actually uh, also improve response times for uh, authenticated users for Drupal seven, uh, in kind of the same way as Drupal eight is working right now. Uh, Render cache has also been made by the same authors as the uh, caching implementations in Drupal eight. Wim Leers and uh, Fabian, someone. Um, you can also improve performance by installing additional supporting software like uh, opcode caching for your PHP uh, where it will just cache the PHP files themselves. So they don't need to be loaded from the data for, from the, the hard drive each time, but they're just coming from memory. Small optimization saves some time. And also you can use varnish, of course, for any anom uh, anonymous requests and even for uh, authenticated requests, but you're going to be you yeah, you need to be doing quite some difficult stuff to get that done. But for anonymous requests, Varnish is pretty easy to set up, and it's going to be uh, saving you a whole lot of trouble with, uh, well, slow responses. And, of course, you need to leverage browser caching. Make sure that every asset you're sending to the user, sending to the browser, 
has the proper uh, cache, ma caching metadata so that the browser knows, oh, okay, this is an image, I can store this indefinitely and never request it again. Or uh, for your JavaScript and your CSS files, if they're aggregated, they can just also be stored indefinitely because each time there's a new version, you're gonna be having this new long random string of characters. So they can ju just be yeah, used very long. Just make sure that works okay and usually you're fine. So you're wondering, probably, why is he mentioning caching as in, in uh, yeah, the last instance of the, the slides? Well, caching only masks problems. I mean, if you have a slow page, sure, caching can um, cache it and make it, make it faster on re uh, return visits, but the initial visit is gonna be slow. And if you have uh, an editor who likes to save stuff every, well, hour or so, that means your entire page cache is being cleared every hour or so. So it's not really effective to be caching then. Also, as soon as someone opens a session somewhere, no more caching. And it's easy to get wrong. I mean, look at how, how long it took for caching to get properly implemented in Drupal 8. It's not that they made many mistakes, but it is really difficult uh, to get right. So I think caching is something which, which always needs to be considered. You also always need to do it, but you also always need to think about it last and make sure that you're actually solving your problems first and then further optimizing using cache. So perceived performance. Um, let me get a little bit of drink first. Like I said, perceived performance is how your end user perceives your product to perform. Uh, that means that the sooner uh, your browser starts rendering, the sooner they will be happy about it. As soon as they start to see something, they can start using the site, for, for, of course. So how can you do it? Well, an easy way to, to do it is to remove render blocking uh, assets like JavaScript and CSS. And you can do that by moving it from the header where they're usually at to the footer. That means they won't get loaded until the entire HTML has been loaded. But in the meantime, everything which is above the fold, as they, as they say, um, is getting rendered already because it's loaded first. You can also implement lazy loading solutions to, uh, well, lazy load images or blocks or stuff like that. A, li a little like what, what Facebook is doing with, with the blocks on the side and stuff like that. You can also do that with Drupal. Um, in Drupal 8 with the big pipe uh, module, of course, and then it will be awesome. But in Drupal 7 it's possible as well. Um, I, for example, maintain the lazy loader module, which allows you to do image lazy loading. And um, that works like a charm. It brought, for, for some of my projects, it, it halved the, the, the time to first render just because the images were uh, not required to render. And like I said, you can also do activity feedback. Whenever you're saving something which, is, which takes a, a, a little while or uh, saving many things, just implementing a throbber or a, a progress bar gives your uh, user the illusion that something is going on and therefore imp improves their perceived performance while they're not actually doing anything. But it's just a mental thing. So reloading, relocating JavaScript, how do you do it? Well, it's basically uh, a matter of giving your um, JavaScript information which you're passing on to Drupal um, a little bit more information. You're saying you're adding the scope key, which has uh, the value of footer, which will make Drupal move it to the footer. That's all there is to it. And if you're um, confident that it is uh, possible to as asynchronously load it, you can also add the defer uh, key and set it to true. And Drupal will output the JavaScript the script tag in a certain way that your browser will... Um, well, defer loading 
until everything else has been done, and then maybe it will start loading the JavaScript. A really small change, but can uh, improve the perceived performance of your web page, well, a lot. So we're almost there. So what can you take away from this talk? Well, performance is always dependent on your context. It is always dependent on your project, on your client, on what you want to achieve. So you need to focus on what you want to achieve. You need to set goals and focus on them. And don't, don't think about all the noise beyond, beyond it. Just, just the goals. Those are hard enough. And always think about performance while you are developing. The, the example I gave earlier about loading uh, users one by one or all at the same time. It's a little, a little mind shift to think uh, like that. Like, okay, am I going to be loading many or one of these? As soon as you're thinking, okay, I'm going to be loading many of them, you're going to have to be looking to, for ways to load everything at once instead of one by one. If that's a, 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 yeah, it's a small change of mind, but as soon as you, you uh, make it your own and you start working uh, like that, you're going to be having less performance problems. But don't optimize too early. First, make sure that whatever you're building works, and then optimize it. I've seen people working on optimizing something and by optimizing it, making it more difficult to read and understand and therefore never reaching their goal in the first place. So, thank you.